people coming in and finding seats, but make yourselves at home. Good evening. My name is Barbara Altman. I'm the director of the Oregon Humanities Center. And I'd like to welcome you to the uh, second of the 2008-2009 Colin Rowe Thomas O'Fallon Lecture in Art and American Culture. The O'Fallon Lecture was established by a generous gift from Henry and Betsy Mayer, named in memory of their nephew Colin, son of University of Oregon law professor Jim O'Fallon and his wife, artist Ellen Thomas. The topic of the lecture alternates between a focus on American jurisprudence and on art. The first of our two O'Fallon lecturers back in November was Henry Jenkins, Professor of Comparative Media Studies at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. This evening, we're very pleased to host Lawrence Joseph, legal expert, professor, and poet, and Jim O'Fallon himself will be introducing our speaker in just a moment. Before I give Jim the podium, however, I'd like to express great appreciation to the staff of the Oregon Humanities Center, who organized every aspect of Professor Lawrence's trip. My thanks to Julia Hayden, Melissa Gustafson, Peg Gearhart, and Dylan Bragg for bringing us this wonderful gift and making sure he and his wife got here safely and are well put up. Professor Joseph was good enough to do a 30-minute interview with me this afternoon for UO Today, our interview TV show, and I hope you'll take the opportunity to watch that broadcast when it airs or else to find it on the UO channel. I also hope you'll consider coming to Professor Joseph's poetry reading tomorrow. That's Friday, April the 17th at 3 p.m. in the new home of the Creative Writing Depart uh, Program. They are located now at 818 East 15th Avenue on the UO campus. And the address is on the posters, which are at the front and the back of the room. And we can tell you, um, give you directions and tell you where it is if you're interested after this lecture. But now, without further preamble, please join me in welcoming Professor Jim O'Fallon, who will give the real introduction. Jim? Thank you. When uh, Larry and I talked a few weeks ago about how casual or informal or formal the lecture should be, I don't think we anticipated this level of informality. <laughs> um, at least I didn't anticipate it, but I'm very pleased to see you here, and I'm particularly pleased to have uh, my friend's <clears throat> friend Larry here uh, to give this lecture. <clears throat> Most of the people, we're now uh, on the 22nd Colin Lecture. Uh, most of the people who have appeared are on one side or the other of the divide, the art in American culture or law in American culture. Larry clearly is on both sides of that divide as a leading artist in, in uh, poetry and as a uh, scholar of, of law. Uh, he is I think in the terminology of, a, of an earlier time, a polymath. Uh, he started young as an undergraduate at the University of Michigan. He won the Hopwood, Hopwood Award for, for poetry. Um, and when he <clears throat> uh, got started on, well, I guess he went from, from there to pick up a second MA at, the, uh, at, at Cambridge, uh, Magdalene College in, in writing. Uh, came back to the University of Michigan Law School, and this is where he earns the kinds of credentials that uh, law faculty pay attention to when somebody is applying for a job in a, in a, in a law school. Uh, clerked for the uh, well-known G. Menon Williams on the Michigan Supreme Court. And this was when I first got to, to know Larry. He, uh, I was teaching at the University of Detroit, and he applied for a teaching job there. In the, in the modern world, we are used to people coming into the teaching market with a significant body of scholarship already done. We've imposed that on the people who have come behind us. It was not the case when people of my generation went through this process. Uh, and interestingly enough, the main thing that Larry brought with him was a small sheaf of poetry. And after I read that, I went to my colleagues on the hiring committee and said, we've got to hire him. Uh, because the mind that was evident in that poetry was special. And I think that you are going to get a taste of that specialness 
um, tonight. He's now spent uh, lives as an essayist, as a poet, as a practicing lawyer in, on, on Wall Street and as a uh, professor of law. And he is going to, well, and obviously also the author of Lawyerland, which is a very striking piece of prose that uh, if you're inclined, you can pick up on the back uh, bench going out today. <clears throat> but he is uh, speaking to us tonight of <clears throat> the languages in which he exists, the languages of poetry and the languages of law. Please welcome Larry Joseph. Thank you, Jim. I'm going to put this on. Can you hear me in the back okay? Let me know if you can't and then we can, we can play with this. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for, uh, I'm, it's just a real privilege for me to be here. Being in the language of poetry, being in the language of law, one. On November 8th, 1985, Clifford Geertz delivered the Tanner Lecture on Human Values at the University of Michigan. His lecture, The Uses of Diversity, was published in the winter 1986 issue of the Michigan Quarterly Review. Meaning, said Geertz, comes to exist only within language games, communities of discourse, intersubjective systems of reference, ways of world making. Meaning is through and through historical, hammered out in the flow of events. The limits of my language are the limits of my world, Geertz added quoting Ludwig Wittgenstein's Tractatus Logico Philosophicus. The reach of our minds, the range of signs we can imagine somehow to interpret, is what defines the intellectual, emotional, and moral space within which we live. The following spring 1986 issue of the Michigan Quarterly Review is, in the words of its editor Lawrence Goldstein, devoted to Michigan's premier city, Detroit. Detroit, an American city, includes a selection of journal entries of mine. Our lives are here, notes from a journal, Detroit, 1975. For the first entry, January 8, I write, that is our, my and Nancy's, second week in the Alden Park. I had just moved from Ann Arbor to Detroit. I will commute to Ann Arbor to law school four times a week. The Alden Park is a 1920s Tudor-style apartment building beside the Detroit River on Detroit's east side. Next to it is Solidarity House, the international headquarters of the UAW. On January 15, 1975, I write, no hopeful signs for the economy. Detroit is hurting badly. As Detroit goes, so goes the nation. More and more empty houses and stores for lease and for sale signs. As long as supplemental unemployment benefit pay holds out, but then what? On November 13, yesterday, bone-chilling damp coldness that the landscape seemed to equal. The singular smokestack near Eastern Market. St. Joseph's Towers seen from the Chrysler free Freeway beneath Grand Boulevard the burned out warehouse in an old pole town surrounded by acres of weeds. How much has been lost, how much hidden and buried and forgotten, how much fear absorbs the capacity to see and accept. On December 12th, as I study for my final exams for my final semester in law school, I write, Friday night, late, just finished outlining the enterprise organizations course. Now to review three or four chapters of secured transactions. Floating liens, how a lender protects itself from bona fide purchasers and other intrigues. A cold, snowy night. Papers, books all over the place. Can hear the wind outside howling over the river 
Every once in a while, I look to see if it's still snowing. I think, what if I took the time to work on poetry that I take to study law? But no, of course, the intensity required to write poems must be differently directed. On November 12, 1975, William O. Douglas, because of illness, resigned from the United States Supreme Court. Douglas had been on the court since April 1939, over 36 years, the longest serving justice in the court's history. I was reminded of this while I was reading James O'Fallon's Natural Justice, a book of Douglas's selected writings interspersed with O'Fallon's commentary. One opinion presented in its entirety in Natural Justice is, Doug is Douglas's dissent in Sierra Club versus Morton. The Sierra Club had brought suit for declaratory judgment and an injunction to prevent the United States Forest Service from approving an extensive skiing development proposed by Walt Disney Enterprises in the Mineral King Valley in the southern part of the Sequoia National Forest. The issue was whether Sierra Club had standing under Section 10 of the Administrative Procedure Act to seek judicial review of the government's decision. A four-justice majority of the court held the Sierra Club lacked standing to maintain the action because it suffered no individualized harm to itself or its members. Douglas dissented. The critical question of standing would be simplified and also put neatly in focus, Douglas wrote, if we fashioned a federal rule that allowed environmental issues to be litigated before federal agencies or federal courts in the name of the inanimate object about to be despoiled, defaced, or invaded by roads and bulldozers and where injury is the subject of public outrage. Environmental issues, Douglas held, should be tendered by the inanimate object itself valleys, alpine meadows, rivers, lakes, estuaries, beaches, ridges, groves of trees, swampland, or even air that feels the destructive pressures of modern technology and modern life should be partied to litigation to assure that all of the forms of life will stand before the court, the pileated woodpecker as well as the coyote and bear, the lemmings as well as the trout in the streams, that, as I see it, is, Douglas concludes, the issue of standing in the present case in controversy. I read Sierra Club versus Morgan for the first time during the summer of 1974 in an administrative law course taught by Joseph Vining. Vining spent an entire class on the case, taking us through its various factual and technical dimensions, and especially with favor, Justice Douglas's and Justice Blackmun's dissents. Vining specifically pointed out the language at the conclusion of Justice Blackmun's dissent, a reference to a particularly impertinent observation and warning of John Dunn, an observation and a warning of Dunn's that Blackmun quotes in a footnote. No man is an island, entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent as part of the main. If a cloud be washed away by the sea, Europe is the less as well as if a promontory were as well, as if a manner of thy friends or of thine own were, any man's death diminishes me because I am involved in mankind, and therefore never send to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. Devotions, 17. When Sierra Club versus Morgan was decided on April 19, 1972, I was in the second of two years of postgraduate study at the University of Cambridge, studying, or as the English say, reading English language and literature. I had by then decided to return to Ann Arbor where I had been, in a been an undergraduate to study law. In a journal entry dated April 18, 1972, I note, poems, three general categories, Threnodes, Justice, Jeremiah, Psalms, Beauty, Augustine, Conversations, Morality, Camus, then, and keep on keeping on with saint jean Perse and Sam Cooke. Another standing case with the Douglas dissent was decided two months after Sierra's Club, on, on Sierra Club on June 26, 1972. Laird versus Tatum involved covert surveillance by Army intelligence of anti-war and civil rights groups. In early June 72, I took my examinations in Cambridge for part two of the English Tripos and then spent most of the rest of that year in France, reading Albert Camus, Simone Weil, and René Char. 
writing often extensively in my journal. I returned to Detroit in December. During the winter and spring of 73, I worked at Chrysler's Lynch Road Assembly and Clare Point factories in Detroit. In May, I moved to Ann Arbor and began law school in Michigan law school parlance, a summer starter. I don't recall reading Laird versus Tatum during law school. I came upon the case in late 1990 during the buildup to the first Gulf War when I looked at a series of Douglas's opinions dealing with the president's war making powers. I have since then taught Laird every year in a law and interpretation seminar course. Detroit figures substantively in Laird. 10 U.S.C. Section 331 establishes the statutory conditions for the president to follow to call the armed forces into action whenever there is an insurrection in any state against its government. Pursuant to those provisions, Chief Justice Berger wrote in his opinion in Laird for a five-member majority, President Johnson ordered federal troops to assist local authorities at the time of civil disorders in Detroit, Michigan in the summer of 1967 and during the disturbance that followed the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King. Prior to the Detroit disorders, Berger continued, the Army had a general contingency plan for providing assistance to local authorities, but the 1967 experience led the Army authorities to believe that more attention should be given to such preparatory planning. The Army's covert data gathering system, which came to light in an article in the January 1970 issue of the Washington Monthly, is said, Berger, as Berger, is said, Berger went on, to have been established in connection with the development of more detailed and specific contingency planning designed to permit the Army, when called upon to assist local authorities, to be able to respond effectively with a minimum of force. Respondents in Laird, specifically identified only in Douglas's dissenting opinion, persons and groups of persons for whom allegedly the Army maintained files on their ideology, programs, memberships, and practices, included, said Douglas, virtually every activist political group in the country, including groups such as the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, clergy and laymen against the war in Vietnam, the American Civil Liberties Union, Women's Strike for Peace, and the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. The majority in Laird held that the mere existence of the Army's data gathering system did not chill respondents' First Amendment rights because there was no showing on the record of any objective harm or threat of specific future harm. Respondents accordingly failed to establish a justiciable controversy and lacked standing. In his dissent, Douglas first denounced the majority's implicit conclusion that the president has the authority to establish surveillance over the civilian population. If Congress, Douglas declared, had passed a law authorizing the armed services to establish surveillance over the civilian population, a most serious constitutional problem would be presented. There is, however, no law authorizing surveillance over civilians, which in this case the Pentagon conceitedly had undertaken. The question, said Douglas, is whether such authority may be implied. One Kenny went on, search the Constitution in vain for any such authority. To the claim that the respondents have no standing to challenge the Army's surveillance of them and other members of the class they seek to rep represent, Douglas, Douglas responds that it is too transparent for serious argument. To withholding standing to sue would, in practical effect, he says, immunize from judicial scrutiny all surveillance activities, regardless of their misuse and their deterrent effect. In May 1976, I began a two-year clerkship with G. Menon Williams, who was at the time, at that point in his public career, in his sixth year as an associate justice of the Michigan Supreme Court. Williams, a Democrat, had served as governor of Michigan for six two-year terms from 1948 until 1960. In 1961, President Kennedy named him Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs. In 1968, he was named ambassador to the Philippines. Williams was elected to the Michigan Supreme Court in 1970 and re-elected in 1978. In 1983, he was named Chief Justice. He left the court on January 1, 1987, and then taught at the University of Detroit School of Law. He died the following year. The September 15, 1952 issue of Time Magazine features Williams on its cover. 
At an undaunted 41 years old, the anonymous writer for Time wrote, Williams was running for his third, term, third two-year term as governor in a traditionally Republican state. Describing Williams' early career, the Time writer noted that in 1937, shortly after Williams graduated from the University of Michigan Law School, Michigan's red-headed Governor Frank Murphy, also a Michigan Law School graduate, summoned Williams to Lansing to be Assistant State Attorney General. When in 1939, Franklin Roosevelt named Murphy Attorney General of the United States, Murphy made Williams his executive assistant. After Williams served in the Navy, a lieutenant commander with 10 Pacific Battle Stars and a Legion of Merit, and was discharged in 1946, Murphy, then in his sixth year as an Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court, helped get Williams appointed Deputy Director of the Office of Price Administration in Michigan. When his OPA position expired, Williams was named a member of the Michigan State Liquor Commission. Running for governor in 1948, Williams allied himself with the CIO's Political Action Committee, which was anchored by some 400,000 members of Walter Ruther's United Auto Workers in and around Detroit. In 1988, I was asked with others to write a tribute to Williams for the University of Detroit Law Review. Between the time that I completed my clerkship with Williams in 1978 and Nancy and I moved to New York City in 1981, I taught for three years at the University of Detroit School of Law. I had, by 1988, returned to full-time teaching at St. John's University School of Law in New York City. In, in Justice G. Men and Williams, a memoir, I write, he considered himself politically as an heir to the progressive tradition of his mentors, Frank Murphy and Franklin Roosevelt. Like them, he saw himself as a fighter for progress. I noted that a portrait of Williams, painted when he was governor, hung in his Supreme Court office on the 14th floor of the Lafayette Building in downtown Detroit. Williams was portrayed in the center. Above him on one side was an image of Franklin Roosevelt. Above him on the other side, an image of Frank Murphy. Speaking of Williams' accomplishments during his 28 years as governor of Michigan and justice of the Michigan Supreme Court, I noted that he fervently espoused an active government role in the protection of the state's wealth of land, air, and water resources. He publicly applauded Michigan's Environmental Protection Act, authored by University of Michigan Law School professor Joseph Sachs for its unparalleled, far-reaching, substantive provisions and its unprecedented provisions permitting individuals as private attorney generals to seek protective remedial action on the public's behalf. He endorsed the act's express recognition of the public trust doctrine. He firmly believed that the state holds its natural resources in trust for the people. I began my clerkship for Williams working on two opinions. Bryce versus Ring Screw Works, and Bingham versus American Screw Products Company. Williams would discuss with his clerks the direction that he wished a draft of an opinion to take and then give great leeway in the drafting process. If he was pleased with the clerk's draft, he would sometimes adopt it as his, at his, own, uh, as his own almost verbatim. Bryce was decided on November 23, 1976. The opening of Williams' majority opinion reads, this case involves a suit by a discharged employee against his former employer for breach of a collective bargaining agreement. The employee exhausted the contractual grievance procedure. At each applicable step of the procedure, the employer denied the employee's grievance. Under the terms of the collective bargaining contract, the final decision on the merits of the employee's grievance was effectively recourse to a strike by his union. The union voted not to strike over his complaint. We are asked to decide whether the strike vote was the employee's sole and exclusive mode of legal redress, thereby precluding him from maintaining a breach of contract suit against his employer. The federal labor law on this question mandates the judicial review of a final decision on the merits of an aggrieved employee's complaint is barred unless the final step of the grievance procedure is inadequate to provide a procedurally fair decision. In this case, the final determination of the merits of the discharged employee's complaint was the strike vote by his fellow union members. The effect of this procedure is that the decision of whether an employee should be discharged from his employment is dependent on whether those judging the merits of his claim choose to imperil their own economic status. 
those desiring to rule in favor of the discharged employee would pay the price of giving up their own jobs. We believe such a final merits determination is contrary to the federal labor law. We hold, therefore, that such a final decision on the merits of the employee's grievance does not bar the employee from maintaining a breach of contract suit against his former employer. Bingham was decided on December 21, 1976. Up to the point of a detailed summary of the holding, William's majority opinion reads, this complex unemployment compensation case involves the interpretation of interrelated provisions of Section 28, eligibility for benefits, and Section 29, disqualification for benefits of the Michigan Employment Security Act. There are two issues. First, whether claimant disqualified under the act for voluntarily terminating his employment can requalify for benefits under the act outside the state of Michigan. And second, whether claimant, after he moved home to Kentucky, was disqualified from receiving benefits for refusing the employer's offer of his former job, or whether claimant's rejection of this reemployment offer was with good cause because the offer was not an offer of suitable work due to the unreasonable distance between his Kentucky residence and the Michigan job offer. At the outset, it is essential we bear in mind that our Employment Compensation Act, Unemployment Compensation Act is part of a federal state employment compensation system. This federal state system is grounded in the Federal Social Security Act, the Wagner-Pizer Act, and the Federal Unemployment Tax Act, together with state laws enacted in conformity with the standards set forth by these federal laws. The professors who influenced me most in law school, St. Antoine, Vining, Sachs, Camazar, taught what Carl Llewellyn had the insight to see in 1931, that if there is the slightest doubt about the classification of the facts, though they be undisputed, the rule cannot decide the case. The way in which the facts are stated determines how the issue is framed. How the issue is framed is determined by how the facts are stated. Fact advocacy is what Kamazar would call it, as he read out loud from the statements of facts of opinions that he admired to over 100 students in our constitutional law class. While I was working on Bryce and Bingham, I was writing several poems, one of which then opens part one of my first book, Shouting at No One. Joseph Joseph breathed slower, as if that would stop the pain splitting his heart the poem begins. Joseph turned the ignition key to start the motor and leave Joseph's food market to those who wanted what was left. Take the canned peaches, take the greens, the turnips, drink the damn whiskey spilled on the floor, he might have said. Though fire was eating half Detroit, Joseph could only think of how his father, with his bad legs, used to hunch over the cutting board alone in light particled with sawdust behind the meat counter, and he began to cry. Had you been there, you would have been thinking of the old market's wooden walls turned to ash, or how Joseph's whole arm had been shaking as he stooped to pick up an onion, and you would have been afraid. You would have known that soon Joseph Joseph would stumble, his body paralyzed an instant from neck to groin. You would simply have shaken your head at the tenement named Barbara in flames or the guardsman with an M16 looking in the window of Dave's Playboy barber shop, and then closed your eyes and murmured, this can't be. You wouldn't have known it would take nine years before you realize the voice howling in you was born then. Two, the limits, the reaches of our language of our languages, the languages that we speak to ourselves inside us, the languages that we speak outside us to others, the reach of our minds, the range of signs that we can imagine somehow to interpret, hammered out in the flow of events, each of us existing within each of our own language games, our communities of discourse, our inner subjective systems of reference, our own ways of world making, Language is the means by which we are woven into the fabric of human life and thought, how we come to inhabit the world. Because being is transient, we are each of us transient within, within our own being. Being within the reaches of our language is being in time, 
and being in time is being in some place or space, those intellectual, emotional, and moral spaces that each of us lives our lives in. Two or three. In 1983, two years after Nancy and I moved from Detroit to downtown Manhattan, I finished Curriculum Vitae, the title poem of my second book. The poem closes, the poem's closing 26 lines read, Now years have passed since I came to the city of great fame. The same sun glows gray on two new rivers. Tears I want do not come. I remain many different people whose families populate half Detroit. I hate the racket of the machines, the oven's heat, curse boss men behind their backs. I hear the inmates' collective murmur in the jail on Bobian Street. I hear myself say, what explains the Bank of Lebanon's liquidity? Think, I too will declare a doctrine upon whom the loss of language must fall regardless whether Wallace Stevens understood senior indebtedness in Greenwich Village in 1906. One woman hears me in my sleep plead the confusions of my dream. I frequent the Cafe Dante, earn my memories, repay my moods. I am as good as my heart. I am as good as the unemployed who wait in long lines for money. From the summer of 1982 into 1983, I worked as a litigation associate at the law firm of Sherman and Sterling. Its office is located at 53 Wall Street, a block from the New York Stock Exchange. I worked on a case that appears in the federal reports in 1984 under the title In Reflight Transportation Securities Litigation. The facts of the case can be found in the United States Circuit Court of Appeals Eighth Circuit opinion written by Judge Arnold. Flight Transportation, a Minnesota corporation, provided air charter and other general aviation services. William Rubin, Rubin was Flight Transportation's president, chairman of the board, and chief executive officer. In June 1982, Flight Transportation made two public offerings of securities, selling on June 3rd 715,000 shares of common stock, and on June 4, 25,000 securities units consisting of a debenture and a number of stock warrants. Drexel Burnham Lambert and Mosley Hallgarten, Easterbrook, and Whedon were the lead underwriters. On June 10 and June 14, Drexel and Mosley delivered certified checks totaling over $24 million to flight transportation and full payment for the two offerings. Flight transportation deposited these checks in its account at a New Jersey bank. A few days later, on June 18, the SEC halted trading in flight transportation securities and brought an action against it, its subsidiaries in Rubin and the United States District Court for the District of Minnesota, alleging that the defendants had violated the federal securities laws, especially the anti-fraud provisions. The District Court entered a temporary restraining order and appointed a receiver. The receiver transferred the remaining proceeds of the June 3rd and 4th offerings, some $22,700,000, from Flight Transportation's account in the New Jersey Bank to a segregated interest-bearing escrow fund account in a Minneapolis bank. On June 23, Drexel, represented by Kale, Gordon, and Ryan Dell, and Mosley, represented by Sherman and Sterling, filed a class action in the same district court on behalf of themselves and all other persons who had purchased flight transportation securities pursuant to the June 3rd and June 4 offerings. In August 1982, Drexel and Mosley moved for a constructive trust on the escrow fund on behalf of members of the public to whom they had sold the June 1982 securities and sought a preliminary injunction against the distribution, commingling, withdrawal, or other disposition of the fund. During the following months, Judge Arnold wrote, before going on with the facts, the litigation became increasingly complex. I was then finishing a law review article that I had begun in Detroit. The causation issue in workers' compensation mental disability cases and analysis, analysis solutions in a perspective was published in the March 1983 issue of the Vanderbilt Law Review. The article's opening sentence reads, the causal relationship between employment and a disabling mental or emotional injury presents one of the most complex issues in accidental injury in workers' compensation law. In the article's introduction, I write, 
The first purpose of this article is to explore comprehensively the technical and policy dimensions in workers' compensation mental, to, mental disability cases. Second purpose is to clarify the distributive and jurisprudential considerations that courts and legislatures inevitably confront in their attempt to resolve the mental disability issue. A third more general purpose is to provide a method of technical and policy analysis that applies not only to mental disabilities but also to other disabling diseases of unknown etiology, including cardiovascular and back-related disabilities, which contain essentially the same kind of technical, policy, administrative, and medical causation issues as mental disabilities. The article concludes, I write, with the perspective of a proposal for a legislatively created compensation system designed and structured to deal specifically with most of the technical and policy considerations in mental disability cases in cases that concern disabling diseases of unknown etiology and provides the structure as well as the advantages and disadvantages of this proposed system. Around that same time, I was asked to contribute a poem to ecstatic occasions, expedient forms, 65 leading contemporary poets select and comment on their poems. Each contributor, editor David Lehman explains in the book's preface, was asked to provide a poem accompanied by a statement on the decisions that went into its making. The poem that I submitted was That's All, which is also in Curriculum Vitae. I work and I remember That's All begins. I conceive a river of cracked hands above Manhattan. No spirit leap with me in the womb. No prophet explains why Korean women thread atomic machinery's machines behind massive empty criminal tombs. Why do I make my fire my heart's blood? Two or three ideas thought through to their conclusions. Make my air dirty the rain around towers of iron, a brown moon, the whole world. My power becomes my sorrow. Truth, my lies are sometimes true. First hand, I see, now see the God whose witness is revealed in tongues before the exchange on Broad Street and the transfer of $2,675,000,000 by tender offers are acts of the mind and the calculated truths of First National Citibank. Too often, I think about third cousins in the shoof. I also think about the fact that in 1926, after Céline visited the Ford Rouge foundry and wrote his treatise on the use of physically inferior production line workers, an officially categorized displaced person tied a handkerchief around his face to breathe the smells and the heat in a manner so as not to destroy his lungs and brain for four years until he was laid off. I don't meditate on hope and despair. I don't deny the court that rules my race is Jewish or Abyssinian. In good times, I transform myself into the sun's great weight. In bad times, I make myself like smoke on flat wastes. I don't know why I choose who I am. I work and I remember. That's all. My sp statement about the poem reads, I began That's All in late 1982, two and a half years after I moved to New York City from Detroit. I wanted to write a poem that incorporated various aspects of both cities and of the Shouf Mountains in Lebanon from which my grandfather emigrated and which was immersed at that time in fierce warfare. I wanted to make emblematic images of Detroit, New York, and Lebanon. Detroit as an expression of labor, New York City as an expression of finance capital, Lebanon as an expression of religion's violence. I also wanted to create a person, the eye of the poem, who reacted to and was part of these worlds. Seven or so years later, on J January 26, 1990, I wrote in my journal, Schuyler, his secret. He contains Williams, Moore, Stevens, Bishop, and several aesthetic megawatts of the French avant-garde, a very smart talker. The following summer, I was asked by the editor of Poetry East to write on a book of poems that was important to me. The morning of the poem was written shortly after James Schuyler died on April 12, 1991. It appeared in Poetry East Summer 1992 Praises issue. Although every poem he writes is spoken by a particular subjective self, I write, 
Schuyler's eye is at the same time revealed as consubstantial and coextensive with the poem itself. The writing subject is not only dependent on language, but is also part of it, placed in the position of questioning its own and its language's status and function. The language of a Schuyler poem exists on at least two separate yet overlapping planes, one where language is used as a medium of, medium of communicating meaning, the other an aesthetic plane, where the language of the poem that embodies the speaker's self possesses an autonomous value. Schuyler's poetry, like collage, demonstrates a sharp demarcation between the imagination and the and actual everyday life. The real world is engulfed in an aesthetic, aesthetic venture. During that time, I was asked with other writers to write a comment on the first Gulf War for the Hungry Mind Review. Make no mistake about it, I began war after thoughts. The Iraqi military state is barbarous, an affront to the dignity and inviability of Arab life. But almost immediately after the Gulf War began on August 2, 1990, I wrote, the President of the United States utilized his enormous war powers to amass over a half a million American troops, as well as hundreds of billions of dollars of armaments within eight weeks. War on America's part was inevitably made. Socially, the President showed how efficiently the United States could collectivize militarily, although in other social realms, wealth distribution, medical care, sustenance for the aged, poor, and infirm, labor, the abject failure of the state to collectivize its powers remains manifest. Historically, the President reaffirmed that these United States have been effectively in a state of war since the late 1930s. After over a half century, the war state so profoundly permeates the American economy and consciousness that ours has become a society in which 90% of its populace appears to have no moral problems with elaborately abstract and media-controlled justifications for state-sanctioned violence. As for the moral implica implications, the violence committed by our armed forces in excess of that needed to dislodge the Iraqi army from Kuwait and the disbalance between the amount of violence our armed forces unleashed and the values, political and moral, we purported to uphold, well, take a look, for example, at the recent cover of Newsweek. Without any irony, the lead domestic story is violence is in mainstream, scripted beneath another headline, Apocalypse in Iraq. Neither article imagines there might be possible connections with the other. The question of how much, how much power our constitutional democracy should provide its executive and armed forces is not only one of the most crucial domestic political issues, it is among our most necessary moral issues, too. In April, the April 20th, 1992 issue of The Nation includes a review of mine of Adrian Rich's book of poems, An Atlas of a Difficult World. Rich, I wrote, looks at herself and her subject matter hard, pushing out the complexities of human behavior through an I who is essentially functional, although at the same time personal and social. For Rich, the poet inside a wrecked society must will and imagine common language to get to human love, which is for her the central subject of any personal or social order. A poetry of ideological commitment must enter the heart and mind, become as real as one's body, as vital as life itself, that's what makes it poetry. This past February, I gave a talk in Chicago on Wallace Stevens. Most poets, even most critics, as well as the continuously growing readership of Stevens' poetry, think and speak of Stevens as a poet who also underwrote insurance, I said. But I said, Stevens had nothing to do with underwriting insurance of any kind, nor was he involved in any of Hartford's business decisions. Stevens was a lawyer, Hartford's in-house counsel for handling surety bond claims. He was, in fact, a first-rate lawyer, considered, as one colleague put it, to be the dean of surety claims men in the whole country. In a talk, The Irrational Element in Poetry, which he presented at Harvard in 1936, at the age of 56, Stevens rhetorically asks, why does one write poetry? Because, Stevens says, one is impelled to do so by personal sensibility. A poet writes poetry because he's a poet, and he's not a poet because he is a poet, but because of his personal sensibility. What gives a man his personal sensibility, Stephen said, I don't know, and it does not matter because no one knows. Poets continue to be born, not made. 
On July 24, 1942, Stephen writes to Harvey Bright, one is not a lawyer one minute and a poet the next. You said in your first letter something about a point at which I turned from being a lawyer to writing poetry. There never was any such point. I have always been intensely interested in poetry. No one could be more earnest about anything than I am about poetry. But this is not due to any event or exercise of the will. It is a natural development of an interest that always existed. Moreover, I don't have a separate mind for legal work and another one for writing poetry. I do each with my whole mind, just as you do everything that you do with your whole mind. In another letter to Bright sent a week later, Stevens writes, lawyers very often make use of their particular faculties to satisfy their particular desires. From an article exposed to solvent, worker faces hurdles by Felicity Berenger in the New York Times, Sunday, January 25th, 2009. When the University of Kentucky published new research in 2008 suggesting that exposure to a common industrial solvent might increase the risk for Parkinson's disease, the memo was a source of satisfaction to Ed Abney, Beringer writes. Abner, Beringer says, is a 53-year-old former tool and die worker now sidelined by Parkinson's who had spent more than two decades up to his elbows in a drum of solvent, trichloroethylene, while he claimed metal piping at a now shuttered Dresser Industries plant here. The University of Kentucky study, according to Beringer, had focused on Abney and his co factory co workers who worked near the same 55 gallon drum of the vaguely sweet smelling chemical. The study found that 27 workers had either the anxiety, tremors, rigidity, or other symptoms associated with Parkinson's or had motor skills that were significantly impaired compared with a healthy peer group. The study was, Mr. Abner thought, the scientific evidence he needed to claim workers' compensation benefits. He was wrong. The medical researchers were not signed the form of testing that Mr. Abney's disease was linked to his work. Individuals like Mr. Abney R. Beringer writes, caught between the conflicting imperatives of science and law. And there's a huge gap between what researchers are discovering about environmental contaminants and what they can prove about their impact on disease. The gap has ensured that only a tiny fraction of workers' compensation payments are received by those who were exposed to harmful substance at work. From an article, Infinite Debt, How Unlimited Interest Rates Destroyed the Economy by Thomas Gagan in this month's Harper's Magazine. Some people still think our financial collapse was the result of a technical glitch, a failure, say, to deregulate derivatives of hedge funds. In fact, Gagan says, no amount of New Deal regulation or SEC watching could have stopped what happened. The problem, Gagan goes on, was not that we deregulated the New Deal, but that we deregulated a much older, even ancient set of laws. First, Gagan writes, we removed the possibility of creating real binding contracts by allowing employers to bust unions that had been entering into these agreements for millions of people. Second, we allowed those same employers to cancel existing contracts virtually at will by transferring liability from corporate shell to, from one corporate shell to another or letting a subsidiary go into Chapter 11 and then move to cancel the contract rights, including lifetime health benefits and pensions. And then we dismantled the most ancient of human laws, the law against usury, which had existed in some form in every civilization from the Babylonian Empire to the end of Jimmy Carter's term. That's when, says Gagan, we found out what happens when an advanced industrial economy tries to function with no cap at all on interest rates. Here's what happens. The financial sector bloats up. With no law capping interest, the evil is not only the banks prey on the poor, they have always done so, but the capital gushes out of manufacturing and into banking. What is history really but a turf war between manufacturing, labor, and the banks? A journal entry dated this past September, September 24, 2008. Locating historically the time of the financial collapse, Friday, September 12, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, September 13, 14, 15. The Times and Monday the 15th paper. On Sunday, as the heads of major Wall Street banks huddled for a third day of emergency meetings at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. No one connects the fact that these meetings took place two blocks from the site of the World Trade Center, seven years and one, two, three, four days after the suicide bombings of the World Trade Center towers. Four, five blocks 
from our apartment, right over here again in the neighborhood. These are lines from The Game Change, a poem in my book, fourth book, Into It. The Fantastic Imperium is set in a chronic state of hypnotic fixity. I have absolutely no idea what you're talking about, was his reply, and he wasn't laughing either. One of the most repellent human beings I've ever known, his presence a gross and slippery lie, a piece of chemically pure evil. A lawyer, although the type's not exclusive to lawyers. A lot of different minds touch and have touched the blood money and the dummy account in an offshore bank, washed clean, free to be transferred into a hedge fund or a foreign brokerage account, at least half a trillion ending up in the United States with more to come. I believe I told you I'm a lawyer, which has had little or no effect on a certain respect I have for occurrences that suggest laws of necessity. I too am thinking of it as a journey, a journey of conversations, otherwise known as the divine comedia, is how Asip Mandelstam characterized Dante's poem. Four. Going back into my journals, I discover that on January 4, 1990, I wrote, ideas for titles of poems, the constant and endless struggle with fact, admissions against interest. On August 22, 1990, I wrote, working on admissions against interest, ready to write it. An admission against interest is an admission to the truth of a fact by a person, although the admission is against his or her personal or economic interest. It is an exception to the hearsay rule and is allowed into evidence on the theory that the lack of incentive to make a damaging statement is an indication of the statement's reliability. My poem, Admissions Against Interest, is in Before Our Eyes. It is in four parts. Part two in its entirety reads. Now what type of animal asks after facts? So I'm a lawyer. Maybe charming, direct, yet as circumspect as any other lawyer, going on about concrete forces of civil society substantially beyond anyone's grasp and about money. Things like, you too may be silenced the way powerful corporations silence contractually attract my attention. The issues bifurcated. Why divide the dead, the foreign minister asks. What's one life when you've lost 20 million? And if what has happened during my life had been otherwise, could I say I would have seen it much differently? Authority? Out of a deeper strata, illuminations. A lot of substance chooses you. It's no one's business judging the secrets each of us needs. I don't know what I would do without my double. Five. So it is. So it is like this. Being in the language of poetry and being in the language of law. Since I have this, I can talk anywhere I am. I mostly don't think about it. I think Stephen's statement that it's, you know, it's just the way my mind operates and it's my whole mind and I don't separate the two out. 
uh, but clearly at times I focus on different types of language, but I don't think of it, um, I mean, in, in any kind of way. But in, in when I do think about it, if I'm asked to think about it, and this gave me an occasion to think about it, um, and I've been thinking about how it meshes, is that there's certain periods of time when I'm obviously in all sorts of legal language, and also, also in all types of language of imaginative language, either in writing poems or writing fiction or writing essays or whatever I'm writing, but essentially dealing with the language of poetry and as a poet. And this is going on constantly in my whole mind all day, every day. And so I could pick out anything at any time and, 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 and go through this. And so part of this was just an effort to put different types of languages and ultimately to to, I mean, the, the, the thinking about how they mesh is going to be the, the, uh, so the kind of the act of the mind of the poet. In other words, I com I'd call compose that in some kind of way, because I think that's the only way to think about it. I mean, I've written on the differences between legal language and language of poetry, but that you know, has a certain type of interest in everything. But the actual living in both um, uh, is something that, as I've done this now for a very long time, um, it was very interesting for me to try to focus on where this is. And so I went back into certain kinds of things. I mean, I could have said, I mean, we, we, as a law professor, and I've done it for 28 years now, I think, every, I, I was thinking about how many cases I've taught, and how many I've taught over and over again, how many little worlds of facts that I go into, just day in and day out, and, uh, um, and where that affects the other side of my imagination. I probably could come up with things, but I mean, um, I think one common thing is an interest in the, both in the poetry, certainly in law is required, but in poetry, an interest in the way the world operates. I have a, a, a fortunate or unfortunate imagination for the social world. But I also have a fortunate or unfortunate imagination for the aesthetic realm. And the two in poetry are really that define for me the range of my poetry. Law is not an aesthetic adventure. It can be. There is. There can be. There can be a great deal of it. The, the forming of things and the way in things which are stated is aesthetic, but it's not an aesthetic venture. It's a political venture, essentially. It's a venture that's it's, it's rooted in society, and so the two overlap in that way. I don't know if that. No. Do you think the intuitive level of the poetry helps you to deal with? I think sometimes. I think sometimes. Sometimes a personal meditation. Um, we're recording it, so people don't hear your question. The question was is whether the intuitive side of poetry or what's required to write poetry and the way I write poetry <coughs> influences the way I think of as a lawyer. I actually write poetry very much the way I think a lawyer puts things together. I use files, I use notes, and I compose. Um, uh, the, the compositional side of it. Uh, is what you learn if you write poems, and that's what you study. The compositional side of, um, of uh, the lawyers do depends on what you're doing. And Stevens again said the lawyers can use the particular faculties to reach, reach particular results, and so can poets. And, and you want to reach a certain kind of feeling in the poem and figure out how to do it. And, but you're imagining a feeling rather than imagining something else that you're imagining along. It's not a good idea to get too much imagined feeling if you're creating a legal text. So, <laughs> I tend not to I tend not to emote when I'm teaching, for example, and, uh, and, and, because it, I don't consider it the laws of finally as a discipline that you know where we, uh, it does different things than try to produce an aesthetic object that contains emotion. So there I separate them. I mean, there's obviously some overlap. I teach, I and mean, I don't practice. And Stevens was in house counsel, and he ran his own office, and he shut the door all day, and he got very good at what he did. I and mean, then he had to wait till his 50s to get that kind of freedom. And, um, but he didn't, he didn't litigate, he didn't try cases, he didn't do that. I, I think that would be almost impossible. With the, with the, I know I, I couldn't do it. Now with the drive to, with poetry part of the gyms of interiorizing, um, too much exteriorization, uh, teaching you can control it somehow.
right hand to the extent of you as a person. I'm more curious if that intuitive side is helping you to deal with the fact that the other side is is, is that separable, you know. Um, so that maybe it's kind of an afterthought, you know, but it, it helps you to I, I see things from a different way. No, I never think of it that way. There, there's so always an ear to even to the whole mind. Right. I never say to myself, oh, because I'm doing this with the poetry, that helps me think of what I'm doing here or wrong. I think, I think a certain way of narration becomes important. I think the statement, what I talked about, the statement of facts and statement of issues, I think you can transfer that. So there's a forming dimension to it. And I think I can, and I like that kind of thinking. I always like for people to think that way. There's a lot of very, the best of the legal theorists think that way. And something like Douglas was just, he just pinpoints it. He's writing this right, you know, longhand. And he's writing it right off the top of his head. He's that good of a lawyer. And you find sentences like Douglas, which are absolutely perfect. I mean, Laird versus Tatum anticipates the surveillance problem that we've had in the last five, four years, five years of citizens. I mean, he saw the problem in 1972, in December. And I had read that right around the time of the first Gulf War, and I was watching what the president was doing with the powers, the war-making powers. Once you send 500,000 troops to the, to the Persian Gulf, you're going to go to war. And the president did that. They knew that. Of course they did. It wasn't so. And, you know, what happens then to Congress? What happens? The, 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 the president has not gone to seek a declaration of war since 1941. Uh, these are problems, as we all know, have not gone away. So that becomes part of the. the sorry, and do I write about war. As a poet. Does, does Douglas's sense of war versus Tatum help you as a poet? Yeah, I'd say that. I'd say that. Just the sheer intellectual brilliance. I think we should probably say thank you once again and head for the...